Welcome to Pablo Hit Investigates. In today's episode, I'm talking to the great Larry Goldings again. He was one of the first guests on this podcast, and I was very happy when he contacted me, telling me um, that we should do a podcast where we talk about our classical influences. Of course, it was a no-brainer to say yes and do a part two with Larry Goldings. And uh, we had a beautiful conversation where we played a lot of piano for each other, talking about our classical influences and how we incorporate those influences into our playing, into our music. And we talk about people like Ravel, Gabriel Fauré, Chopin, John Williams. It was so much fun. And you can imagine this was exactly what I was dreaming of when I was a little teenager coming up in music, uh, that I could talk to my heroes about their process and maybe even have them show me what they're doing. So this was a dream come true, and I'm glad we can share it now. If you like this podcast series, please subscribe to this channel. And if you would like to support the podcast more, you can become a patron on patreon.com slash Pablo Held. It really helps. Another cool thing is this little notebook that I've uh, put out. You'll see I have an oil stain here already. I'm really using it. This is investigation notes, a uh, notebook that I put out where I write down all my uh, things that I don't want to forget, things that inspire me. And you can get this on my Bandcamp page. All right. I wish you a lot of fun with this episode. I hope you find many insights and useful things in it. Enjoy. Well, um, where did we, you know, where awkward. did we leave off? <laughs> it's, hmm. it's a big cup. For a big. Big guy. For a big guy. This is, uh, I made cold brew last night All and. Right. You know, I warmed it up. I mm. warmed up my cold brew, and it's delicious. <laughs> cool. So, am I interviewing you? Or are you interviewing me? What? It's just, just what are we doing? I think we're we're hanging out. We're hanging out. Yeah. I'd like to know from you. Um, did you hear? What's the first music that you heard that was um, classically oriented? That uh, sparked something well i can't really say because i grew up listening to my father play the piano classical music and and jazz and yeah. my mother also and but the thing is and i think this connects us um i really um uh, i really feel at home with mom po and i think that this is be because they they played it they liked the music so they played the records but they also oh. played like the the pieces on on piano did they play Mom, Mom Poe's um, performances? Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I uh, didn't know that. You knew about him way before I did. Maybe maybe not because... Oh, because you're younger. But I, I, didn't, I didn't know about him until Bill Stewart told me that Carla Blay liked him. Oh, wow. Okay. That was on the road somewhere, you know, so I was well into, you know... Yeah. So it was late, but it was a it was a turning point, even though it was late. Yeah, what how did it feel for you? There was just something about, you know, his economy of notes, you know. The vaguely French Frenchiness of it that yeah. that I already was attuned to because of whatever Satie and Ravel and everybody else. Yeah. And, um, uh, the way that he could create dissonances that were seemingly new to me somehow, even though yeah. they were familiar, he just found a different v way. Also, it was very Spanish too. I mean, I was mm -hmm. familiar with Spanish, just sort of that broodingness. Something hard to describe, earthiness of it. Yeah. Um, so I loved that it was some sort of weird fusion of 
French and Spanish with this economical thing that a was not hard to play, you know, like Mm -hmm. I was able to kind of slowly go through one of the books that I found and, um, just the, uh, the dissonances were so beautiful and somehow put together in a way that I can't really, um, I can't really name another composer that does, does it the same way. Yeah. You know? And, um, interestingly, I think a side note about Carla Blay, apparently she loves Mampu, but she doesn't like the way Mampu plays Mampu. Did you? Oh. Did I didn't know that. I didn't. I didn't know the color Blay Monpo uh, oh, connection at all. So that you did. Yeah, he said that. I think he said that Carla loves Monpu, but Monpu playing Monpu is just way too um, sentimental. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I th- I feel like whenever he plays it, there's no other way to play it. I mean, I have yeah, some some you know. I think uh, Michelangeli played some of it and uh, Rubinstein as well. And Rubinstein, I, I love the yeah. way you say that. Rubinstein, yeah. Very, very Deutsch. Uh, yeah. And Volodos, you know, Arkady Volodos, great yeah, I've Russian. Seen, I, I haven't really, is it a woman? No, he's he's a man for sure, oh, I think. When did he, when and, did he switch? Uh, he didn't switch. Oh, he's always a yeah. man. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> oh, he made a blu- beautiful album. Uh, uh, I think Volodos plays Monpo. Wow. And um, okay. he, has a, he has a big sound and also uh-huh. did some arrangement of uh, of Monpo's uh, pieces that are interesting but funny because they are way more virtuosic, you know, than... Oh, really? As you, you know, as you describe Monpo's... Some of, the, some of it is very intricate, but most of it is very... Yeah. Economic, like you said, like yeah. two or three voices and... What always inspired me was having two voices or three or four, but it sounds like an orchestra the way yeah. it's put together. And that's that's the shit. That's why I, that's the same with Monk, you know. Yeah. The same with Carla Blay, actually, yeah. in a way. She, I got to really get inside some of her music for a year when I was with her. Mm-hmm. You know, the tour where I was playing organ and she yeah. was playing piano, and then and to see. And I was reading. I mean, uh, everything was written out. So I really got to see how sort of architectural she was and why I was reading. You know, it's like because Uh she's orchestrating me within the band. You know, it's just like kind of mind blowing. It's like I'm another voice that has the ability to play multiple voices. But it was wild. But, um, Similarly, like if you, if you look at her early, you know, stuff, the the stuff that Paul Blay always yeah. played, you know, it's a perfect example, yeah. you know. Um, Vashka is something that Monpo could have written. Yeah, totally. Um, but again, that was uh, OK. So that's so you heard that early on. Um, what? Uh, yeah, and other guys like Ravel and Debussy and uh, my yeah. father like to play Scarlatti and Bach and all the all the greats. So that's wow. that was ringing in my head uh, from from the beginning. But also James Taylor and uh, um, Keith Jarrett and you know Herbie Miles, uh, Shirley Horn, Pat Metheny, uh, Quincy Jones. I'm thinking of all the. Cassettes that we had in the in the car, Schofield with you, you know, uh, Hand mm-hmm. Jive. Uh, that's that's an important record for me, you know. Yeah. And we we used to listen to that in the car, and uh, so yeah. I got I got introduced to a lot of things through my parents, uh, subconsciously, you know, by just being around. But then right. also I remember specific moments where my father or my mother would show me something. Like my father tried to hit me to. Because as a kid, I loved In a Silent Way. But he tried to hit me to Bitches Brew a couple of times and was like, check this out. And I was like, I don't, I don't get it. Somehow I, I could take In a Silent Way, but I couldn't Bitches Brew somehow. Yeah, and they were pissed. They were like, oh, no. <laughs> get it together. <laughs> he's not appreciating Bitches Brew. <laughs> and he's nine. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to send him to therapy, okay? <laughs> 
Jesus, I wish I had that childhood. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, some, of, some of the things I had to find out for myself, you know, uh, like the, my, my form of re rebelism in, in, you know, uh, as a teenager was like, no, I, I need to find out myself what I like and I would right. go into other musics and, but then eventually found my way back around and. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, and I too had a cassette education just because my father was an appreciator of classical music and was always listening to things in the car. And the thing that always comes to mind is. Mm. Whoa. was like wait a minute that's blues wow that's yeah. Brahms Brahms Symphony number no. four And then he does, I remember reading an analysis of this, and at one point he goes, he takes the mm. but part of his development, he just, it's the same melody, but he just keeps going down. Ah. So, he... so the right. melody is really that. It's, the melody is really just a downward thing that he keeps spiraling. Right. And man, I mean... So, but yeah, Brahms is yeah. heavy. Brahms is heavy. The just certain, certain. Just he was just that much more contemporary than Beethoven somehow. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, just like some of the dissonances and structurally, and uh, just the, the yeah, those melodies and yeah. the chamber music. So I love. I heard a lot of Brahms, and. I think it was from classical music that I realized, oh, here's a, just some other early things that I heard. The Bach Brandenburg Concertos, but played on Moog. Wow, by, by, by whom? Wendy Carlos, Walter Carlos. Oh, That's a person who right. have a thing. Yeah. Um, like Horowitz. Um, <laughs> no, so, yeah, so uh, I heard... Now, here's a testament to, well, both to Wendy, Walter, uh, Wendy Carlos, but really to Bach. I mean, that that everything is so perfectly, you know, I mean, all she did is, not all she did, it was a huge feat to do that with monophonic. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Forever. And all the, uh, did you, have you heard that recording? I have, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's amazing how she was able to bring those qualities out of, you know, like, the synth oboe or the synth, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like amazingly expressive, but the music is, is all there. I mean, I was just, when, when I did finally get the original, you know, the, you know, a real version of the Brandenburg series, I liked it just as much. I, you know, I, I was yeah. still loved it. It was just, uh, um, it says, says something about, about the quality of the, uh, of the content of the music, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of focus sometimes on sound and, and how you play things, and that's obviously very important. But yeah. if the content isn't as deep as, I mean, it's incredible. If you, if you play something like that deep on a, on a shitty instrument, like even more yeah. shitty. Uh, well, it's like it's the thing on, me of, the, uh, of the Ravel String Quartet on, right. what's that instrument called? Owned Martineau. Yeah, yeah that, it's crazy. that also you would have to have been an overdub situation, right? I like, think it's an ensemble, actually. Oh, it's an ensemble with four of them? Yeah. I didn't know there were four in the world. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, that's a perfect example. It's like, right. yeah, everything's there. And yeah. in, a, in a certain way, you hear some voices even more clear, even more clearly than you yeah. maybe you would. And you're just like, wow, Ravel is a motherfucker, you know? What do you think about Tomita? I didn't know anything about Tomita until maybe 
10 years ago. Um, and I heard that Tomita. You say Tomita? <laughs> Let's pull the whole thing off. Yep. I didn't know what, I don't know what I was going to say about Tomita. Um, I, I did, I do know that he's, he did a lot of classical. Yeah. Drinks, right? Yeah. yeah. I got to check it out. It's good. Man, his, his, there's some reworks of uh, Debussy's uh, music, which is incredible and actually mm. make, made me appreciate certain, like when you hear a, a piece in a different uh, instrumentation than you're used to, or even a different artist, it brings mm -hmm. out certain different uh, aspects of the music that some, sometimes get lost with a recording or with an artist who rushes over a section that you might appreciate in a different tempo or something. That's true. Yeah, I, when, I remember when the first time somebody asked me, oh, you like that piece? We should perform it. So I'm like, yeah. I don't know, whatever. You know, I didn't understand how one performance could really be. You know, I just figured anybody who could play that music was amazing, yeah. you know. And then later you're like, wait a minute, you hear a, because I grew up, the other thing that I just happened to have was maybe, I don't know, maybe it belonged to my father. It was Rachmaninoff, was Ashkenazi playing the Rachmaninoff piano concertos. Yeah. I, I have very vivid memories of of listening to that stuff. Oh, yeah. What is it? Just, it's like, I don't even know if that's the key, but it's just like, orchestrationally, I, I also loved that, that music. Yeah. The way he, the French horns to define the movement mm -hmm. of the harmony. And Ashkenazi, who was conducting from the piano, yeah. I'm saying. Um, He's incredible. Yeah. How do you do that? <laughs> must be so hard. Um, Duke Ellington did it. <laughs> that's how Hans Groener would do it. <laughs> Groiner conducting from the piano. <laughs> um, that stuck with me a lot. Um, uh, okay, and then, um, but also the thing was, I was into pop music, and things that were on the radio when I was a kid was like Billy Joel. Right. And Billy Joel really stuck out because it was like, wait a minute, I, I heard some, with certain of the songs, I heard some connection between the, the way that was moving and classical music, mm -hmm. you know? Of course, I read an interview and he's talking about how he, you know, he started with classical music. And, um, but I also remember feeling, I also remember just being tuned into how the bass, like there's something about bass movement, it, you know, It's like there's something about the the way you understand movement of the bass mm. that really can affect the harmony, you know? Yeah. And uh, that's what I was hearing in classical music a lot. Yeah. And I think I think I was always attuned to. I guess that was that was the way I was trying to figure out stuff is from hearing it from the bottom, you know? Which I think is, which is advice that I usually give people who are struggling with with ear training, you know? Yeah. But if you focus on the bass that, you know, usually there's not much information, I mean, not so much information in the bass as is on top. So that gives you some sort of focus or, or guideline to, to follow. I'm, what I'm curious about Larry is um, if you hear something like that, how do you get it into your system? I mean, you're, you're, you're transcribing it or learning it by ear, but what, what happened? What's the next step for you? Well, To give you a specific example, Prokofiev, okay, Romeo and Juliet. Mm. Um, there was something in there that just uh, just flipped me out. Yeah, and that was again. I don't know what key it's in, but it's this move. Yeah. 
it's so beautiful. It's like the lover's theme or something yeah. like that. It comes in and out of the ballet. And so an example of that, I sat down with a thing, you know, pre-internet. And, uh, you know, just tried to figure out what's going. It's the piz pizzicato strings are doing those, you know. First of all, so I analyze it, right? Yeah. So I go, you know, just like you do. So say he's in D. He's got a melody. He's got, I, the, I hear the outer. I remember it was like, what's going on? So figure out the outer notes. Yeah. You know, he goes up, he goes down to go up, you know, which I love because he's in, he's in D. Let's say he's in D. Yeah. And it's all the bass, the bass that allows him. Yeah. He's very slickly go up a half step. Then he goes. Wait a minute. Mm. He starts in D, goes up to E flat, resolves in D flat. <laughs> yeah. With what seems like no movement. Yeah. You know? Yeah, super straight. E flat over A flat, C over A flat, which is his five chord. Mm. So it's a five chord that is a major seven with a major five. If you want to look at that that way, yeah. I don't think Prokofiev would describe it that way. <laughs> Say, man, check it out, shot five, motherfucker. <laughs> um, and the pizzicato. Mm. And the D flat's always a surprise. Yeah. Even yeah. though. Mm. He's going all country on us. But it's like... yeah. yeah. But he, put, he, he starts in D. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think at some point he starts there and does it again. Yeah. So like, yeah. It's all it's all D major scale there. Like B minor seven yeah. for a second. Wow. And then he starts there. Uh, sorry. D over A. Yeah. B over B. So, <laughs> so, so what I take from that is I go, the thing that, I mean, every, every step of that is brilliant. But the one thing that I grabbed onto was the idea of a 5-1. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute. I mean, it's almost like I had heard that before hmm. and never seen, never seen anybody get there that way, for yeah. sure. But it reminded me of like some Disney. Yeah, totally. Disney kind of music. And I've heard it in Ravel as well, right? So I was like, okay, how am I going to use my five as a major seven sharp five? So that's how it starts. It's like, well, there's five ones all over the fucking place. Yeah. So I was like, um, yeah. There it is. I was like, oh, that's it the works. chord. Yep. It's the Disney chord. Yeah. So I do that a lot now. That yeah. that is now a device. Me that too. When my, you too? I'm guilty too. Yep. Uh, so you can add and you can add the six too. Yep. That reminds me of Claire Fisher, who who used to do that, you know. Yeah. 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 So so then it becomes a device. Yeah. I mean, I have so many, not so many, but I always think of them as devices. I mean, yeah. if you can use them artfully, then they sound better than a device, but they are devices. Yeah. And um, not that I can say I can think of another time where Prokofiev used that, but I'm sure he did. But mm. um, so there's an example. Um, even as early as like, I remember when I heard this, I think I had somebody, you know, one of my early lessons was to very slowly, 
I didn't even get beyond the first. Yeah. I don't think I maybe learned eight bars of that yeah. piece. It's enough in there. <laughs> yeah. To know that you could take the diatonic scale and make it sound that beautiful. You know, it's like, okay. And then you hear Bell Evans. You're like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, that was a, an early uh, thing. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, none of this stuff inspired me to become a great reader and player <laughs> of music. <laughs> Yeah, I can relate. Years. I can relate to that. I have a feeling your reading is is better than mine. Uh, not to mention your uh, your facility, but I think. But in a way, depending on where you want to go with it, um, uh, it's been good enough. It's been good enough for me. I mean, I would love to be able to. Somebody just posted something about Roland Hanna because it was his mm -hmm. birthday the other day, and Roland was uh, at the New School when I first got there, and was mm -hmm. very took me under his wing and was very good to me. And um, he would constantly ask me if I'm practicing my um, Chopin etudes. Yeah. You know. Um, Did you? Not really. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've, you know, I never really worked that hard on, I certainly didn't do all of them and I only really glanced at a few of them. But again, my, I've listened to, probably all of Chopin's piano output. Yeah. I mean, all of it, but a lot of it. Um, another example, uh, there is a Rubinstein recording of this piece. Again, I think I might have looked at the book once just to make sure I had a, a chord right, but yeah. so lazy, so lazy as a, <laughs> as a person. But uh, it vaguely goes... Uh, all the left hand wrong i'm doing it you know i'm just playing the harmony yeah It's just, it's like fucking. What's, what's the so name of this piece? It's a from. It's one of the Novel Etudes. Ah. And, yeah. Rubinstein okay. in general is uh, such a such a great in, interpreter of Chopin's music. I mean, who's who's your favorite for Chopin? Um, and that's the one the person I know best. And it's you know it's I haven't done a huge comparison i think i've heard Polini. i have mm -hmm. Polini play the etudes yeah i like Polini, and i got to see Polini. and i don't think playing chopin but playing beethoven no 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 that was brendel i got to see brendel playing beethoven mm. Polini might have played some beethoven i don't remember um but uh yes i do and i have to, and then it, there is something about the first time you you know a classic recording, you know, you really do get used to the interpretation. Absolutely. The tempos, you know, the way it was recorded. Mm -hmm. um, like, I loved both, uh, well, of course, the early Gould Goldbergs and the later Gold Goldbergs. Yeah. Later Gould Gold Goldbergs. <laughs> later Gould Goldbergs. <laughs> And have you seen those videos about the making of the one in 1980 or whatever it was? It's all over YouTube. I haven't seen the video. I, I read a book about him and his favorite piano and uh, his relationship to that piano. And wow. they also go to the, through that, the recording processes uh, where he used it. And I think he oh, yeah. still used it there. Or maybe it was already broken. It's kind of a love story with him and the, with that piano. Mm -hmm. Yeah, check out some of the video online. It's astounding. The, the amount of uh, cutting he was doing, you know, yeah. um, editing, which just gave me so much help, hope <laughs> that, yeah. or whatever, you know, yeah. just like 
first of all, that's ahead of his time. He had no shame in doing it. Yeah. And it was tied into why he stopped performing. He, he just felt like there's no way that he could ever get what he felt was the ultimate oh, performance. I, I just had a recording session uh, for my my solo record. And I uh, during this corona time, I recorded the, the solo thing in July. So I was just getting into playing more solo because I always felt like very, very insecure about it. And mm -hmm. uh, throughout this time, now I've, I've written a couple of more songs that uh, make more sense as solo pieces. So oh. I felt like, okay, I should record them. I went into the studio and two of the pieces were written out in, in completely, but nothing super scary, but everything, every note was written down, which mm -hmm. is new for me in that way. Uh, to go into the studio and just play how it should be, you know, and right. not wait for inspiration of, oh, how should I play this line? No, you should, you know, you, you come in soft and then you crescendo, whatever, you know. And I just noticed that I don't have the facility. I'm not a classical piano player. I mean, it's, it's a, a, a stupid realization after all this time. But still, it was like, that's an art form in itself, you know. Yeah. Um, to to be able to I don't I don't control my craft in that way so that I can apart from inspiration just say where I want to play how in what way you know yeah uh, no it's amazing to see how these some of these people break down really what they're going to do you know in terms at least I mean I think the greatest ones can be spontaneous and try things yeah. you know and they talk about how they you know, I was in this hall and I don't know what happened and during the scherzo, but I just, you know, it's like, and, and it's true. I mean, uh, I, I've been watching uh, Chris John Zimmerman master classes online. Yeah. Fucking great. Mm. I, I really like him as a teacher. He's mm -hmm. very kind to the students and he talks about sort of extra musical things. You know, he, he was saying to one kid, this gets off subject a little bit. Oh, actually, well, let me keep it more on subject. He was talking to some, it was for a Chopin competition. He was meeting with all these kids who had been finalists in a Chopin competition, I guess in Poland. And um, this one person was playing, I wish, again, I don't know if it was a Polonaise or what, what the hell it was, but it was something that had a long arc of a, of a melody and stuff. Yeah. And he was saying that... Um, he's feeling like the person's not just doesn't have their mind wrapped around the piece as a whole when he's, when he's playing the melody, even though it's this very slow. And he says, and he sits down and says, try playing it really fast, just kind of so you can hear how the harmony moves and you can hear how the melody moves. If it's only, if the, if you're playing it fast enough that it only takes like 30 seconds to play the whole, the whole idea. Yeah. And I thought that brilliant. You know, I can't remember the piece, Yeah. but it's like it's going through the, you know, that piece that I was just playing or a piece that we know, you know, like. Uh, oh, I can't, actually, I'm not going to remember that. But if you go through a piece and you just, just so you can really see the long uh, idea. Yeah. So you're not like stuck and it's like, and, and I just thought that was brilliant. Also that he asked this one kid after a, pretty good performance he says are you nervous were you nervous playing for me and he said yes i was very nervous he says and he says uh well if, i think they they talked about whether he was nervous about the piece or he was more and more nervous about his relationship with the audience and mm. they, they talked about the latter and he said you see all these people because this totally applies to us you mm. know see all these people they came here some from far away in their cars and found parking and, you know, set aside the time to see you. Yeah. Because they know that they're going to have an incredible afternoon and that they trust. And so what do you, what do you, what are you nervous about? Yeah. <laughs> I just thought that was just like, so yeah. down to earth. I remember being backstage with James Taylor. It was like one of these big pressure kind of gigs, I guess for him, because there was TV and it was like a really, I was at Tanglewood and it was just like 20,000 people, something yeah. he's been, Doing for years, you yeah. know, and he's back there and he's sort of, you know, 
And then he, I think I'm standing there with Kate Markowitz, one of the um, longtime singers, and, and he goes, this is what we do, right? <laughs> what we do. <laughs> and I thought that, wow, even James Taylor has to remind himself, you know, yeah. like, this is what I do. So it's okay. Yeah. You know, and people, and, and even Chris John Zimmer mentioned something about love. He was like, it's, this is people are here because they want, you know, they love music. They, they want it. It's, it's, so don't be, you don't have to be nervous about that. Anyway, it's a total aside, but I just thought that was so Very refreshing. Good. Yeah. You know, I to hear from such a heavy guy and, you know, I mean, of course he can break down all the technical musical stuff, but you think about how do these people deal with that? Yeah. Pressure, you know? Um, I mean, when I play a, a, a when I, a, 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 at least to me, something that's obviously a fuck up back in the day, especially, and maybe that was only 10, you know, I still do it. Sometimes you just can't, you can't get beyond it. Yeah. It's, it's the yeah. one thing you focus on for the rest of the gig. Even if you played like great later Yeah, to the gig. Somebody asks you, how was the gig? And you go, ah, because all you're thinking about is those one or two things that, that in your mind were a huge, you know. Because you wanted to go somewhere else. What's that? Because you wanted to go somewhere else, maybe, and you failed that attempt, but you're mm -hmm. not able to hear the, the final result of what happened there. And somebody else, even in the yeah. band, might think, this is a great idea. Or yeah. how cool, or... or Finally, or he's I fucking love, up. I love when you when you did that. Yeah, <laughs> I remember being in the recording studio with uh, one of one of the most neurotic. I uh, hope he doesn't mind me saying this because um, I know he's watching. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Who is David it? Sanborn. David Sanborn. He was in the studio. There was this thing that he did. It was he was guesting on my first uh, on my Warner Brothers record where I had Maceo as a guest, and this was Matt Pearson's idea, uh, the producer. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad we. You know, it was amazing to have them in, the, but they weren't in the studio together. They were supposed to do a duet, but um, anyway. But like he did this thing where he was going for this thing, and he goes what? And it was such a powerful moment because it was spontaneous. And he didn't hit the note, but then he, so he, he, he's listening back and he goes, stop, you need to erase that take. Okay. Yeah. And like, it was like, first of all, no, no, we got to use that, that moment. That's great. Yeah. And he was so besides himself with shame that, yeah. that someone would hear that. And most of the people in the control room were like, actually, this happened to me the other day where I was the one <laughs> who was insisting <laughs> that I need to over, I need to um punch something in to correct something yeah and both cave and uh the guys i was working with they thought i was absolutely insane wow yeah i, I kept going i kept on no no no, no, no. come on and I, i spent time on this to, to like see how i could you know get into the right moment and fix it mm -hmm. everybody was like dude what are you doing you know i really couldn't see the forest for the trees i just yeah. couldn't um uh, wasn't seeing the big picture you know i mean now maybe i should hear it again you know a week or two later and see mm. if i'm like oh what's wrong but then again you have to follow your 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 real instincts about things like that but um you should also be respectful to the people who who you respect who are saying dude you gotta leave, you gotta leave it you know yeah. we're getting getting off off course there i had a little list of um other things i, I wanted to i don't mind oh, getting off of course it's it's yeah. fine you know yeah. um <laughs> you know i wish they would they could put the camera right where the person's face is i think i could make a lot of money if i could figure out a virtual camera that always follows where you where you what you're seeing yeah. Like a, like a sci-fi uh, glasses or something like that? I think that uh, I notice when newscasters aren't looking at you, you know, it's very distracting. Yeah. Anyway, so here, here's a list of just things. Maybe this sparks something. Debussy, I already talked about. Oh, here's another one. Oh, yeah. I 
don't even know if that's correct because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing it by ear. But you know that what that's from one yeah. of those preludes. One of the preludes, yeah. So, here's what I grabbed from this, and I'm sorry we don't have a camera. Oh, can I change cameras in the middle? Don't change cameras in the middle <laughs> of the stream. Giddy up. That's a uh, tower of power. Um, try it. Let me try it. Try it. Um, Just leave it like it is. It's fine. It's totally fine. Yeah. Okay. Leave it. Um, yeah. So that one. Yeah. That was that's the that's the one that I stole, and I and I just tried to figure out. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just trying to figure out what it was. So I brought that B up. Mm. You no. Know, and saw it as that. I was like, oh, okay, that just looks like an A flat minor major seven. Then kind of resolving to a diminished chord, right? right? But what if B flat were really the root mm. of that chord? And therefore, it's some kind of suspended five chord. Hmm. Yeah. So what if, but we left out the root, but we just know that it's kind that of it's, there. That's where it's so coming we can from. resolve it as a 5-1. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every time it sounds like a surprise because the bass note yes. is on that flat nine. <laughs> How does it sound if you if you go from the B to the B flat? Or I mean to oh. resolve it, to resolve it to the E flat over B flat. To resolve it to the E flat over B flat. Oh, you mean Oh. I mean what I mean is like, Yeah. Oh yeah, that's good too. You don't need the E flat. A little bit more Brazilian, maybe. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's like some Chico Buarque or something. But like where? Why do you change the chord there? It's the same, and then you go to A flat. Yeah. Now I'm just doing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But right. always, oh, the always the third time when you modulate the chord, you, you change the initial chord. I do? Yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Sorry. It's My fine. mistake. I was just being careless. No, no, it's, it sounds great. Is that right? No. That's it. Yeah, it's a major third on top, right? Yeah. 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 So then, I mean, th yeah, and that's it. Once you figure out that something can be used as, you know, in the context of this, yeah. then you just try to use it every chance you get. Do you know the prelude right? by Ravel? He only wrote <laughs> one prelude. Do you? Yeah. Can I hear it? They, oh, I don't. Well, really, you know, I could try to play it, but. It's gonna very sound very pathetic, but but there's one moment from it. Yeah, play me um, the moment. Woo! And that's the moment. Yeah.
the one yeah. moment the one moment is the yeah. and that's that yeah that's my moment play it again so oh, okay. that's it so a minor wow. seven and then it goes to like a, like a b uh, uh augmented augmented yeah so I, I went to, you know. Damn. I went so to. Yes. <laughs> so every. Even on major chords. Huh? Even on major chords, yeah, you're doing. I, 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 when I do something like this, because I do it the same way like you. But I, I only grant myself that one thing. Like I, I have right. to find a way to do, only do that. But that right before that, doesn't he go uh, this kind of thing? Almost, yes. Uh, yes. That's Bill Evans, you know. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a Chopin piece that I swore. Um, um, the voicings are so sparse and it's so beautiful. Hmm. Um, does this sound familiar? Um, maybe it's, I need more. Um, damn it, I can't remember now. Um, I, I, I basically, I took, I made a tune out of it. Hmm. Um, but I can't remember that either. Um, foray, uh, when I was in high school. Yeah. When did it start with, with, uh, foray? For, with I had you? the hippest, um, really the guy who was responsible for, um, getting me into the, the high school, the private high school that I went to was the music teacher because hmm. My grades, my SAT scores were shit, and um, or I mean they were on the on the edge of, of being shit. And then I I applied, and this guy Keith Danielle, I found out later was just like, just we could really use him, you know. And mm -hmm. then I went to this great school, Concord Academy in Concord, Massachusetts, and had a great education in music uh, as well because of Keith and uh, various other people who were in the department. And he was, a uh, he had done his college thesis on, um, on uh, not Foray, but Poulenc. Mm. But he knew a lot about French music and he was also the chorus conductor. And, um, one year we did the Foray Requiem. And, and I think he gave me the baritone solo, which was that piece that, half diminished mm -hmm. then he goes no. <laughs> um, tell me about the way he understood the half diminished what's your take on it this also kills me <laughs> yeah so that he moves, he moves up the James Bond sound. Yeah. Uh, it's just... Yeah. yeah, okay. This also where he keeps a, a note in the bass, where it's... Uh, da, da. 
you know, he doesn't go to the... So that his bass can keep going up. Right here. It's just a passing chord, but it implies... It's almost like a pivot, pivotal chord, like it could go different places. But he just uses it to go back to A. And then this. This, okay. Uh, this whole sequence is great. F over A, B half, A over C, A minor over C, G9 over D, A, or D minor 6, really. But it's the bass. Yeah, upwards motion. Then, yeah. then you can go back to his F7. And this whole sequence of just sort of playing with the sequence. Just until he gets back to familiar harmonic territory. Then he right. Um, but he does, oh, the other one I love is, uh, oh, I can't play it. Oh, you played it on a record of yours. Yes. It's, it's one of the songs. Yeah. You hit me to the songs. What is that? Damn it. It's, yeah, 4A, I don't know. People say that he knew some shit about older modes, you know, wow. that, he, that he utilized more than others, you know. I need wow. to check into that. Mm -hmm. He's really into the fallopian mode. <laughs> um. 4A. Um, then we got, right, we talked about, well, Bach chorales always come up in conversation when I, if I teach, when somebody just yeah. is playing shit for, for voice leading, mm -hmm. I go, first I go, you're playing shit for voice leading. Sure. That's how you start the lesson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even before you hurt somebody, you're playing yeah. shit for voice leading. And I find them. I find them. You yeah. know, if the, if the, say if the lesson's a hundred bucks, yeah. Bam. 105. Do you know this? It's from one of the Bach chorales. I don't expect you to know every <laughs> sector, but... Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, my God. That reminds <laughs> me of... That reminds me of this. You mean, ah, shit. I have it too, but only because yeah. of you. Yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> um, uh, so good. So good. I mean, that's really what it's all about, isn't it? How Secret. slick are you? Can yeah. you get from A flat minor to E minor in... Bob, I can do that in two moves. You know, <laughs> um, that is a great exercise, you know, and to do it. And it just shows you, man, you're just, I think, I think Roland also used to say it. You're just one note away. <laughs> yeah. Everything's half step away. And in a way, if you're thinking on your feet enough and you, and you can see all the, um, all the possible possibilities of of for that next moment you know um i walked into the new a new school class one day it was uh well there's two things that first of all uh i learned about some classical pieces from some of the heaviest jazz cats jimmy heath was in uh he, he was looking at the ravel string quartet i hadn't heard the ravel string quartet mm. And he said he was checking it out because he was commissioned by the um, Kronos mm -hmm. to write a, a, an arrangement for them for uh, Naima. 
Mm. So it's like, yeah, I got to go back into the Ravel, you know, um, mm-hmm. and we were talking about, there's like Jimmy's Heath telling me like, I got to hear the, hear the Ravel. Like, okay. Another day, Donald Bird, I'll never forget this, Donald Bird. He had his Walkman on, his little, little headphones. He's like, Larry, come here. And he put, and he put on one, one phone on my ear and he had another phone wow. on his. And he was f- pretend, doing pretend trumpet fingerings. And it was Jacques Ebert. It was the Ebert flute concerto. Oh, you that's, know this? yeah, that's beautiful. That slow movement. Mm-hmm. First movement's great too, or the fast one. I don't remember what it was, but that slow movement is just like oh, those mm. extensions that happen in the chords. And um, so that was another that impressed on me that yeah. these guys you just thought as like great jazz guys from a totally earlier generation they they knew music yeah you know you hear about how coleman hawkins loved opera and that influenced his you know or maybe it's ben webster loved opera anyway i've got ravel stravinsky soldier story was mm. a big one for me as was patricia and so much of his music but soldier story i just loved that it was the closest thing to like like a jet like a jazz like like in terms of the size of a group right that you could put together mm-hmm. and you and and utilize them in that way and get like an orchestral sound like that and and yeah. the ideas are so great i also had the villa lobos guitar collection the love, etudes the etudes yeah fucking love julian bream um, plays plays them great Have you seen that video where Bream, a very young and confident Jillian Bream, goes up to Stravinsky? Stravinsky? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Stravinsky sort of like doesn't yep. give him the time of day. Yeah. It's great. Um, Shostakovich, symphonies. Hmm. Before I knew anything about what the hell was going on, I don't know really. I haven't studied Shostakovich really. Um, have you heard Keith? Do the Shostakovich preludes and fugues? I have it. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're good. I mean, I don't have a lot to compare them to, but um, yeah, he plays great. Like he what he's doing. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, he can put it all together pretty good there, uh, Keith. Uh, <laughs> but I remember loving the dark, brooding Russian uh, sound of the of the symphonies. Yeah. You know, um, I'm Russian Jewish, so there was so, so always been something about Russian literature and um music that i don't know the heaviness of it the one time i went to russia i thought the people were just like fucking unhappy <laughs> and i was first i was like well it's russia i mean they're they're they, they're under this horrible government and when did you go there relatively recently i think it was uh just a couple of years ago with peter and bill huh we went to um We were in and out. We went to one outdoor festival, which was yeah. not really that well put together, it seemed. And then, um, but my impression was, if you go up to somebody in the hotel, be- while you're speaking, this is their expression. They're going, <laughs> like... <laughs> Please don't ask anything of me right now. Who, what mm. could you could you possibly want from me right now? <laughs> even though I work here, I'm supposed to. And there's something that struck me. Maybe because maybe my darkness and my struggle with appreciating <laughs> the good things about my life. Maybe that's a Russian thing. Oh, Is it? Something, wow. There was something about my Russian trip that was like. Maybe maybe there's just a, a whole fabric of kind of difficulty in enjoying life. That maybe that's a Russian thing. Anyway, I digest. <laughs> uh, what else do we have? Prokofiev is another one. Come yeah. on. Oh, we talked about Prokofiev. Yeah. Brahms fourth, the Brahms intermezzos, right? But... Oh, sorry. I can't play it, but that's the one I love. (laughs) 
somehow. I, I, I lost it. Uh, pictures at an exhibition. I don't know. That was something that I, my father had or something. Mazorski. Mm. Always loved that. Um, you know, but... Um, uh, and the th just... I think I knew from or from listening to orchestral music that when I would try to transfer it to the piano, that I realized the difference between just playing chords yeah. and moving things within the chords, you yeah. know, inner voices and the and the accident little minor little accidents that happen when voices cross and imply harmony. You know, and don't just state it. You know, implying, was, but also in a way, uh, um, I love it. This is the same thing with that revolt, re revolt thing, What we talked about, where where the music says it's one thing, but then it always says like, but is it really? Yeah. You know, it's not. Yeah. It's not always like in one direction. I love when it goes into, and I think that's what you're talking yeah. about as well, right? Yeah. And you know. God, if only they, 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 when they taught little kids, you know, you also like <laughs> were forced to do an analysis of it. I mean, there's so much going on in that piece. Yes. Yeah. The way one note changes everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that is some slick ass shit. Mm. Uh, in a similar vein, the Strauss that we were talking about the other yes. day that you did the transcription for me of. Mm -hmm. Um, Just wow! It's almost like he had a pitch bend or something on his on his piano, yeah. you know, when he per, per, when he wrote. It's pretty crazy. Uh, pretty crazy. I, there was there was one moment that was my um, my favorite moment somehow, where he goes from the yeah, I think it was this moment. Um, yes. Wait a minute, what is that? You, yeah. you sent it to me, didn't you? So it's C minor, and then it's E major over B. And then B half diminished. And then C minor over E, uh, over B flat. Fuck. How does it work? I mean... It's just voice leaning. Again, I think he just goes, oh, I'm pretty close to the C. <laughs> minor. But I want the bass to go down. You know, it's like, I don't know. It's so slick. Hey, do it again. <laughs> okay, let's take that. Oh, what was the third chord? Oh, yeah. Okay. First of all, that just that alone is yeah, great. It's What incredible. Yeah. Okay, so wait, what is it? Okay. So that's C minor. Sure, but I'm that's, gonna work on that. So that's in the um, in the original key. That would be. Is it? So let me see. That's. Uh, um... Nice. Is it this, or am I wrong? A flat minor going to C major over G. A minor six above where you're resolving. What, what key are we in? So I thought we were in C major. So right. the minor chord should be 
on that note and the the, the melody note was in the ma minor third so that's a flat minor yeah and resolving to c major over g okay oh. <laughs> it's nice if you go then to the d half diminished Wow. Like nice. the monk thing where he sometimes takes the B minor and says G half diminished, like in reflections yeah. or something. Yeah. But that is that's brilliant. Wait a minute. The first chord of that Strauss was what? C minor. With what in the melody? E flat. Oh E flat. That's just fucking great. Yeah, but I, I yeah. don't think I have understood this yet. This yet. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Because it's also nice that the the upper structure is like D minor and C minor. Hmm. It's mind blowing. Other than the fact that the voice leading is all either half steps or whole steps away. You know, you could also say. Huh. You do that. Or take and the B natural, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, in me, uh, amazing. Yeah. Harmony is amazing. But then, then, then there's the next part. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, uh, I guess yet. That's some fucking Wagnerian Straussian shit. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I found this chord the other day with two uh, two minor major sevens a whole step away, which is pretty nice. Yeah. Especially if you know, like, uh, Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, right. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Never really used that one. <laughs> yeah. I was about to do a close. Yeah. Sounds like some Herbie shit. <laughs> Um, what else wow. can we talk about? I, I sent you this piece um, oh. today. Did you did you check it out? Scintillation it by uh, Carlos Salcedo. No, how did you send it to me? I sent it on uh, via email. Uh, maybe via one hour before we started talking or something. Great. Let's it's a over. harpist and composer, and I, I found out about him because I read that. He was one of uh, Coltrane's biggest heroes. Really? So I wow. made an effort to find all of the records that I think Coltrane might have had. And I found this crazy piece. And it's, it's, 
I've been listening to it uh, on repeat for the last months. And today I finally made a list of a couple of my favorite chords from it. Well, here it is. Great. So this is one. I'm going to play you my favorite chords from them. Okay. Here's another one. And here's another one. Uh. <laughs> Wait, is my iTunes playing it? Now? Oh, that's cool. That's cool. We, we could listen to it together. Okay. Okay, let's start again. When did this person live? Um, he was born in the end of the 19th century, and I think he lived until the mid 60s. Mm. Mm. Wow, that's some extending. the music or did you figure these chords out found the music Harpo Marx. <laughs> so Train liked this person? He liked him, yeah. You know that. He was a, was a book about him uh, and he said it in an interview. And he, he was asked, who are your main heroes and he was like uh, Ravi Shankar Ornette Coleman and Carlos Salcedo wow. so, I was, so I was like I need to check out this guy wow and he wrote uh, harp etude books and Coltrane used to practice out of them they're full of uh, full of arpeggios and stuff like that you know Oh my God! And apparently, yep. uh, he bought a harp and said to Alice, "Like, please learn this. <laughs> learn <Wow>. this instrument." <laughs> of course, he also liked Slaninsky. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah, that book really. It's beautiful. Sounds like an orchestra, right? Yeah, and I love how this part is so tonal. I mean, everything is tonal, but... Jesus. <laughs> This also uh, kind of blew my mind when I started listening to these. 
Oh, I think I have, I've heard this before. What is it again? Well, it's Irving Berlin. We know that much. <laughs> wow. tried to find i didn't know what performance to find but this one seemed good it's one of the, it's the first of the sonatas and interludes uh for prepared prepared piano john cage mm. <laughs> and it's melodies it's themes it's just you know the idea of writing a piece for basically an instrument that you're remaking you know sure, yeah. and then you write to that new piano i just that to me when i just um have you worked with that prepared piano no but i've been uh recently i figured out how to make a contact instrument uh a microtonal any kind of microtonal scale hmm so actually, I, I, I recorded a few things. There's one of them. <laughs> I, I want to turn that into something. I have a few microtonal meanderings that I did. I How think do you that play is, this? How you... That was through an arpeggiator. Right, okay. Playing it. Um, what time is it? Sure, is that nine? Is it nine? accidents you know because i was i was just putting through putting different that's the thing when you look at the piano and suddenly it's not the piano and oh, it's yeah. all uh what's that word gestural you mm -hmm. know right you, you get a certain tuning and you start to think you start to think okay that's roughly going to be a triad <laughs> i fucking love that <laughs> savino did it too right with that with that synth that went backwards he right. did. I'm wondering if he also did another thing because he was genius enough to, to have done it even when mm -hmm. you had to fucking be a computer scientist to do it. What is it? He might because I was messing with this microtonal thing where it, you can decide how many notes you're splitting, how much you're splitting the octave. Mm. Well, if you go below 12, that's wild because then what it does is it sort of doubles some notes it leaves out some notes so you can play so you have these skips mm -hmm. between steps right and you can play some fucking shapes really fast can you demonstrate you know, it might take me no i think i can um i'm not gonna remember how to do yes if it takes me more than three minutes to figure this out then we'll it's bail fine. Okay, contact. I go into the contact instrument. I press the little screwdriver. <laughs> there are two ways to do it. There's one way to just to detune the notes within your scale, and then it'll repeat. Mm -hmm. You know, like this. Wait. So I can go to each note and do my own detuning.
It's the Hans Groener microtonal record. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? True. All right. Now that's not the one I want though. I want the one where you can really create a new Okay, let me just might have to go to YouTube. Utilities? No. Oh, notes per octave. There it is. Okay. So, this is 24 notes per octave. Crazy, right? Wow, yeah. Um, now, if you go, now let's make it a little smaller, like uh, 19. Let's try to find a triad. That's a seventh, actually, major seventh. <laughs> so I'm actually playing F, E, and F sharp, a uh, ninth above. All right, check this out. This is what I just love about it. Now, if we go down to like four or five, then it splits it like, like okay, this is wild. I mean, it's just math, and I suck at math. Yeah, me too. No. That's wow. chromatic. <laughs> no, what? Because it's splitting it in quarters. Yep. Right? So I'm. <laughs> can you see my keyboard? Yeah, I can see it. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Now I'll split it in thirds. It's really hard to get the numbers where you want them. On the there we go. Hold on. Oh, Which shit. program is this? So it has to be a contact instrument. Huh. Anything you open in contact. Here's thirds. Right, just diminished. Yeah. Here's seconds. But what happens if you don't play chromatically? Okay. So let's start at... Here's eight. There's a C scale. That's microtonal because you can't split it yeah. that way. So I'm thinking that Joe might have picked, like, say, if he was able to figure this out, which it almost seems like he was. Um, what was it that was given me? Wow. <laughs> you can play that clean? Incredible. Uh I can't come in here. Four. We already did that. Two. <laughs> it's just <laughs> optic. It's so fun. Uh, wait, I can't get to three. Uh, I hate this. I'm not using the mouse correctly on this or something. Six. It's all whole tone. It's all whole tone. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. A little limited harmonically, but um, <laughs> uh, what didn't we do? We didn't do seven. I can't get it to land on seven. Why? Maybe you can type it. Don't yell at me. <laughs> I can't. I can't type it in. And now it's just lost it completely. Um, anyway, I think, do, do, do you have logic? I have logic, yeah. Then you have contact. 
Mm -hmm. Pretty sure. And you can you can try this, and I can I can walk you through it. But here's like, but these fucking microtones, man. Oh wait a minute, this is how you do it. Six. How we work? We we have this, I think. Oh, but if you do. So if you play triads. <laughs> so that must be no. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a technical fiend. <laughs> um, so that's fun. That's fun. But I love this sort of gestural. I love that even on a digital instrument. Yeah. It pretty much gives you the, the effect. To breathe. It's yeah, nice. it's kind of amazing. 13. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> What's wrong, Pablo? Do you like jazz? <laughs> it should sound good, it's, but it doesn't. It sounds grown in the other direction. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Totally. If anyway. jazz is in the middle and Heinz Groener is here, then yeah. this is here. Yeah, exactly. Um, so enough of that about that. But that's pretty fun stuff. Um, a couple other things harmonically that, that have uh, excited me recently, uh, since you asked. Uh, do you ever check out the Mick Goodrick books? No, I haven't. No. I mean, somebody on the road gave me three of these fucking books. That they're like this thick. I want you to have these. And actually, when I opened one of them on a long bus ride, and I started going into it, I did pick up some really cool little things. There's a point, though, like five pages in, where he takes the first concept and then goes like the next level, and he just loses me. And it's mm. really interesting. It's just the idea that you can stack well i don't know if it's just this idea this is what i took from it you can play it's kind of a way of playing going up physically but going down musically mm -hmm. kind of idea so if you like got c minor but then you keep doing minor chords going up but you're actually going to go half step down musically mm -hmm. so c minor, b minor b flat minor but you're going to go up oh okay you know mm -hmm. this this side yeah you know uh that kind of blew my mind um where like they started started making me think well could i write progressions like that that mm -hmm. hide the fact that they're just moving stepwise down you know and maybe hide it by way of different bass notes like don't always have a root in the bass yeah you know so i don't know i'm i'm just thinking this through for the first time right now uh so c minor or let, let's say this a line that does that you know so You know, <laughs> I don't know. Can Trying you, to can you do that find... again and, and yeah. say the and first going, is C yeah. minor and so I'm going C in a minor. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stay with a C minor pedal. Yeah. B minor, B flat minor. Oh yeah, right. 
Or, or kind of do this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Keep going down. So going up, you change the inversion to yeah. maintain the uh, the upward motion. Right. Exactly. I keep having to look over here yeah. to look at what fruit is, you know? That's the way to remember. It's B, C, B flat, a B, B minor, A, A flat, G. Let me try. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, G, 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 yeah. So there's a line. Uh, you almost get the twelve notes, but you don't. Something at one point, at some point, it repeats. I yeah. mean, you get a repeated note. It's almost the twelve tone scale, though. Yeah. Right. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine that don't repeat. Then another one. That's a new one. Then you get two repeated notes. So it's almost 12 tones. So I don't know. There is something deceptive that you can do where you're, because you're going up, it still sounds like you're going up. But isn't it the same thing that I showed you of the uh, Chopin piece with the, with the triads that went down? The... How's that going now? Yeah. C major. B major. Yes. That... Yeah, it's similar, except except it is going down physically. Right. And, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. That's that's similar. That's similar. That's similar. Uh. I wonder if you can apply that, like C minor, B minor. You know, just add, you know, jazz, jazzy notes, like, totally like jazzy notes. <laughs> B flat, A minor, yeah, A flat minor, G minor, F sharp minor, F minor. That's actually pretty hip. Reminds me of something. I've never done it this way, and that's basically the concept going down. Uh, what's that? A, A flat minor, G minor, F sharp minor, F minor, E minor, E flat minor. D minor, C sharp minor, mm. back to C. Holy shit! Sounds amazing. Now, what if we change the bass notes to those? Okay, so I'll still do the descending minor chords. Yeah. Change the bass notes. To like make them sound suspended, maybe. Or I'll alternate. I'll go B flat minor, A uh, B, B flat and minor, D? and now A minor over D. Yeah. A flat, G minor. F sharp minor. Yeah, I don't know. Something there. That does rem remind me also of something. Hmm. Do you know this? No. 
Yeah, it's from Daphne's et Chloé also. There's a... And basically what it is, it sounds to me like... But you leave out every second, second chord. And yeah, you leave out, so C minor, F7, you leave out F7, and then you leave out B minor, and then you play E7. Wait, is that E? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hip. And then he does the same thing, in, uh, or similar, something similar in, in major. But you know what's similar to that is that Strauss. Yeah. Right. It's a relationship. Yeah. Uh, the major, major third relationship, right? The major. Yeah, that's from Wild Shit. And also, when you played that Chopin, uh, Chopin uh, Nouvelle Etude thing, yeah. the way he modulated through the keys sounded also like major third relationships. Oh no, no earlier, yeah, yeah. I've it's been I've been playing this uh, this uh, list Liebestraum. You know the Liebestraum. I've heard it. Yeah. You know, he, he does the same thing there, you know? Yeah. Major third. Here's, yeah. You know what I got fascinated with? This piece. Oh. Um, the what first it? time. It's it's by Grieg. Uh, uh, not Grieg. Um, it became the, it's the thing you hear at graduations mm. all the time. It's called Pomp and Circumstance, not by Grieg. Is it by Grieg? Oh, I'll have to... Uh, um, not Greek. Sibelius, Poppin? maybe? No, he's English, uh, British. Br um. Okay, but anyway. Um. I just want to do the, the first time is different from the second time. Yeah. Um, at one point it goes. I know. First time it goes. so beautiful. beautiful yeah um talk about bass movement you know mm -hmm. and contrary motion yeah <laughs> mm. just that he voices it differently the second time yeah. But for some reason, this hit always hits me. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to 
go somewhere else here. But all that is is a way to go. Yeah. Right. Hmm. He was hip, man. He was into the gospel bullshit. <laughs> Whoever it is we're talking about. Yeah, Not we'll Britain. we'll we'll put it here. We'll put it here. Yeah. Um I, I, I'm curious, Larry, how do you internalize stuff? I mean, always when I see you, you I think you know so many pieces, of course, of the jazz literature, but also you seem to be yeah, there seems to be no no limit. How do you internalize so much and, and keep it there so you can access it every time? I don't know. You do the same thing. For me, I, it's, again, it's just it's just um, understanding it as as a as a as a device and using it in my practice. You know, right? But my, I mean, complete pieces like that. There's so many devices oh. in there. You know, so yeah. Well, I don't know a lot of complete pieces, you know, outside of the jazz literature, but um, that was just one I happened to analyze. Right. Actually, I've known it my whole life because you hear it on television all the time. It's the it's the cliche thing that they play at graduations. Mm. Uh, Pomp and Circumstance by Mick Goodrick. <laughs> and um, just for simplicity's sake. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I don't know. I put it put it in different keys, you know. Usually, yep. just to see how, see, just to understand it more. Yeah, you know? and you see what you don't understand yet, right? Yeah, and um, things that always sounded like some, you know, big reharmonization, you realize are only different because the, because he harmonized it differently in the bass, like this thing. Instead of this, first of all, this upward thing is great. Sorry. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And the bass line doesn't tell you a thing, really, mm -hmm. about really what's going on. You really have to, I mean, that could be anything, but it's, there's not much going on harmonically. One, five, one. Yeah. Four, one, two. Mm. That's all. There's three chords that he's using in the first couple bars. But so much movement. And the second time. Just the, at that as a, as a mood. Uh, you know, instead of... That's the piece. Yeah. How dumb is that? <laughs> no. Yeah. Usually, when you break it down, it becomes super simple. Yeah. But who who was somebody, or how did you get to that point where you were able to tell what is what and what is, um, you know, so it's, so you can break it down like that. Like hear it. Yeah, hear it, but then also analyze it because sometimes you hear something and you think it's wild, then you break it down. But you have to have some sort of ground rule thing going yeah. to be able to tell what is what. Right. How did you work on that? Was there something that was particularly helpful? I mean, I just know that there were certain things early on that would I would get stuck on. Like I remember... Um, Hmm. No, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I can't answer the question. I, I just, <laughs> for some reason, very early popped to my brain because I remember I had the real book, mm -hmm. and I didn't understand what was going on with this song. You know, except what's brilliant about that song is the the melody completely outlines those upper structure triads, you know, as I remember. Um, 
uh, where does it start? Very early. Oh, it starts mm-hmm. on the uh, the melody is the fifth, uh, and then goes six, yeah, and then E flat major. Right, but what's the melody? Da, da, do, so it's C C C seven actually. Oh yeah. Right. But those those chord tones are just totally inside those triads, you know. Yeah. And I remember I remember realizing then that oh, all you need is the to know those triads, you know, to get those sounds. Mm. Then I spent years like discerning like when I should use the triad. You can't just use them, you know. They they're 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 quick ways of getting to those different tones but you don't necessarily just want to use one uh, randomly you know mm-hmm. certain sounds so um this has nothing to do with your question but uh, i think just i've always um at least maybe not as much as i used to when i was trying to figure out like something by ear and I could hear that the person had this note and this note and this note, but I'm still not getting the chord. It was just a question of, I've got to find it eventually. <laughs> it's <laughs> on the piano. Yeah. So I remember just like trial and error, like for, for some voicings. It's like, no, he's not playing that. No, mm-hmm. he's not playing that. Mm-hmm. And it's like when you realize like there is a solution, it's there. Yeah. I mean, some things like with Monk, you, you can't, whatever, you can't get the effect you know, of a chord because of the way he's hitting it. Okay, yeah. that's one. But, you know, there's only so many things he could be doing at that particular time. So mm-hmm. um, just the knowledge that the more you know, you know, and then the more you work with new sounds that you're discovering, then you're going to hear, then the next time you hear that sound, you'll recognize it. You won't yes. necessarily hear it. Mm-hmm. You know, you necessarily unless people have perfect pitch you know but it'll be just a chord recognition thing like mm. oh yeah I use that you know like if i hear somebody do you know i now it's something that i do a lot unfortunately <laughs> and i know that that's that's a dominant seven yeah. you know you know above yeah. the half step above the chord yes so then you learn that, and, you, and then you go, well, what's the next step I can take with that? If that's a dominant seven, let me do some of the things that I would normally do to a dominant seven. Mm-hmm. So start using that, and you, you hear somebody else, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's that thing, you know, whatever. Put a sharp nine in there, or, yeah. or a regular nine. Yeah. And, or you go, oh, well, if this works to superimpose that voicing of a of a seventh chord, then other seventh chords must work in parallel, you know? Because, mm. or because I heard, because I, I recognize that, and then I heard Ravel do something, you yeah. know? Yeah, or whoever, yeah. you know? It's like, wait a minute, that starts with that chord that I know. Yeah. And then it just becomes, you know, but you have to be continually curious, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. I, there's, there's so much I don't know. It's like when I listen to "Do to You," yeah, for instance, there is a French dude or dude, <laughs> dude, that dude. <laughs> what the dude he is? <laughs> um, uh, I feel like it's my duty to no. I feel like, <laughs> like I cannot hear "Do to You." You my cannot. Ear, hear, oh, you are, cannot hear it. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's, I, even though it's tonal music, mm. uh, I just don't know where to begin. I haven't tried. I suppose mm. I, I could sit down with four bars like I would normally do or two chords, you know, mm. and just try to do what I was just explaining. Like, okay, I've got that note. I've got that note. Or I could, <laughs> I could get the score. But, you know, I, the point is that there's only so much so far that, you know, that I can hear or that I understand, you know, that, that or, or that I can turn into a language. Yeah. You know what I mean? 
Like that guy's got a language. Yeah. The way Vince Mendoza has a has an orchestral arranging language. Yeah. Like you know, it's like what is he like with? Maybe it's the way he combines instruments. Maybe it's the way he doubles. Mm. Uh, maybe he's giving a certain section of the orchestra slightly different role than you would normally hear them do. I don't mm -hmm. know. I haven't analyzed it, but I know that there's something about Vince Mendoza's writing that is different. And that is definitely influenced by like, classical music, you know, yeah. uh, same, same goes with a lot of different, uh, not every arranger. I mean, I think some arrangers are more, a little bit more generic sounding than others, you know, mm. be they clever and musical but people like uh him and you know ogreman has a similar kind oh, of yeah. like that's an ogreman thing maybe it's yeah. you know maybe because he's using roads you know or whatever it's still he's using things orchestrally you know yeah um but uh what were the some of the arrangers that you took uh, where you took certain things or where you took things apart i always like nelson riddle i yeah. always loved Frank's arrangers. Yeah, me you know. too. I mean, even from the first time I heard, you know, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, what's that? Yeah. Why does that just that little ending add this harmony? What's going on? You know. Yeah. Uh, or um, uh, I also love uh, like Sinatra's earlier arrangers, like uh, Axel Stordal, mm, who was actually I don't, I don't know. He was from. Um, Axel Stordal was from uh, Norway, hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then he came to the States and went to, I guess, L.A. or New York or I don't know what it was. And he co-wrote uh, I Should Care, Axel oh. Stordal. Um, But he had some great shit. Uh, I also loved, uh, yeah, Claire Fisher. And I've yeah. just recently, but I didn't grow up knowing Claire Fisher. I'm a, I'm sort of late to Claire Fisher as a piano player, which I'm embarrassed oh. to say because I found this early Claire Fisher record on iTunes recently with Gary Peacock, young Gary Peacock. Mm -hmm. The tunes on there are great. Mm. That guy was seriously great. Um, so I love Claire Fisher's arranging. Um, I'm trying to think thing that uh, things that I might have picked up, I don't know. Um, who else? Who else? Let me think of um, singers that I. This is record by Claire Fisher uh, with Claire Fisher and George Shearing playing bossa nova tunes. Do you know that one? Mm -mm. Just two pianos? No, mm -hmm. no, no. Uh, Claire Fisher arranged like uh, woodwinds for George oh, Shearing to cool. play uh, Joe Beam's tunes. Oh man, I, know, I haven't heard that. I think you're gonna like it. It's it's wow. incredible. It's really wow. really incredible. Um, Shearing is also a great mm. arranger in his way. You know, I mean, on the piano for yeah. small groups, and pretty much what I learned about reharmonization early on was from analyzing um, a few Shearing solo piano things. Yeah, you know. Parallel minor chords, mm -hmm. and then on the bridge he goes. Wow! He starts from G11, all minor chords. Yeah, I was just like, "That's it." Which That's record is this from? This was from a record called. Uh, it was on Concord. And it's I not don't... my ship, or huh? no? That's MP... is it my ship? Yeah. That's amazing too. It's, it sounded it sounded uh, sounded familiar. Oh no no, it could be from a different one. Could be from a different one. Uh, I thought it was from my ship. My ship's got my ship, and it's got yeah. green sleeves. And it also has some WC uh, moments where yeah. he like yeah. goes into one of the preludes. And yeah, man, that guy could play. Yeah, 
Uh, but he goes, this is particularly beautiful. Oh. <laughs> yeah. He goes way out of the key. So, play again. Wow. Yeah, right? Wow. And then he does it again. He goes like... You know, sometimes you, you learn a move like that or a concept like that, and it just goes, yeah. You know, it's like, oh, they're all the same chord, mm -hmm. all the same quality of chord. Mm -hmm. Just have to be quick enough to know that you can put the, you know, that your melody will. And that was huge for me. But the thing is, you still hear the. That's the magic of it. You still hear the song and you still yeah. hear the harmonic relationship. Yeah, you're not destroying the song at all. Did you're you not, put them in not, context it, already? Uh, have you tried this? Put them what? in context with the original chords and see why it works with all minor chords? Well, for the most part, it's just because you're, you're approaching the, the chord that you really need to hear by half steps. You know, you have this amount of time to get to your E. Yeah. And you have this amount of time to get to that guy. So to me, that's the only thing that you need to know. And then you just have to voice well, right. you know. And then Hank Jones, similarly, oh, yeah. had some devices that... It was just so slick. Um, yeah. Some of his arrangements, you know, of, of, of things. Yeah. You know, whatever it is. Like, or is that Tatum? That's our Tatum. But then Hank. He copied used, it. Yeah. He copped it. And he kind of did another version of it based on Tatum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's there's so much, mm. so much. Um, Does it happen to you too? If you hear something and it's you're doing something else, and then it just hits you, and you have to stop everything, just to, just to to get it. Yes, sometimes I'm in the car and, <laughs> yeah. and I'm very dangerously turning yeah. my because um, I'm not sure if the DJ is going to come on in time before I get to my destination. Yeah. Uh, you know, turn the tape on and if, you know, at least I'll have it and I can play it for somebody else and find out what it is. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, sometimes you just gotta know. Mm. You gotta know. And it's the same with anything like Peter, Peter, when Peter Bernstein and I were young um, and we were living in, in New York and there was no internet, you would go, one could go to the um, Lincoln Center Library and listen to records or better yet uh like we were on a hunt for like obscure standards you know in the moment i met peter we were both yeah. talking about tunes and stand you know this one and, and so we would go to the lincoln center library and you could go it's like oh remember that tune by alec wilder let's find some other alec wilder tunes you know you couldn't that was the way we did it back mm. then <laughs> Uh, young man, and um, <laughs> then you'd have to photocopy it, you know, 10 cents, five cents, and then suddenly we'd be playing a new uh, Alec Wider tune, you know, mm. you know, it's like kind of tell, like, oh, yeah, look, it's cool. Um, and discovery, man, and there is something to be said about the fact that everything's so. Everything 
you had to make, yes, everything's so available now. Yeah. That people don't have curators, you know, to, <laughs> to tell them what they should be checking out and yeah. what they should not waste their time with. You know, there's too much. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it's good, you know, but for people who are like trying to figure out what are the 50 things I should, I should get to know this year or something, you know, to yeah. really like, you know, you could waste a lot of time with some stuff that doesn't have a lot of value or information. Yeah. Um, so that's why, well, yeah, one of the things I do on, on Patreon is I'll make Spotify lists. Some I haven't done in a while, but you know, and if somebody tells me like, I had never knew this existed, you know, yeah. that's great. I just was telling somebody, uh, an organ student, about a Billy Preston record that people don't know about, which was a huge turnaround for me because this guy, Dave Matthews, not the uh, pop singer Dave Matthews, mm -hmm. an organ player named David Matthews in uh, San Francisco years ago, gave me a cassette of this Billy Preston record because it was out of print. Now you can go on iTunes or whatever and go to the VJ recordings of Billy Preston and go to the second half of it which is on one particular record and it's this gospel record he made when he was 20 where he overdubs on organ and piano mm -hmm. and it's i mean he was only 20 and it was probably and it's still something that you could take a lifetime to what's the record called if you just i don't know what that original one was called but if it's it's on a record a cd i mean a digital thing with two records and it's called the Complete VJ, V E E J A Y. Yeah. And, um, you know, I feel like if I hadn't heard that when I did, maybe I'd be dead right now. <laughs> okay, you're laughing, and that's. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it's a serious topic. No, I was mugged once, and this guy's like, Do you know the VJ signs? <laughs> Press. Um, the other day I talked to Blake Mills and I, Oh, you got, you got with Blake Mills. Yeah. I mean, we had, we had an interview already in November, but then he released that first song of the upcoming album. Oh yeah. And I was like, we need to talk again. This is where I'm not going to release the interview and we don't talk about it. So he was yes. like, um, yes. and he, he was like, uh, sure. Let's talk on Monday. And I was like, would be great if I could hear the whole record somehow so we can talk in detail. And he was like, here it is. He did? He yeah. gave it to you? And then we talked for two and a half hours going through each song. Now that I have Blake's um, perspective on it, mm -hmm. I would really like to have yours as well. How how was the process for you to, oh. to work on that music? Oh. oh, well, I was, you know, I was only on a few sessions, you know, um and seems like you're on most of the record i am they even took a song of yours he told me okay well that was i brought in i literally <laughs> i hadn't figured out how to transfer logic at that point from my desktop to my laptop so i literally brought my um <laughs> the imac the imac i mean it's just all in one I mean, I, I remember seeing, uh, who's that guy who loves Zalinol, great piano player um, in L.A. I remember seeing him at a gig, and he had a fucking iMac. Scott, I was like, oh, Scott Kinsey? Scott Kinsey. Yeah. I was like, shit, if Kinsey can do it, I can do it. Sure. So I brought my iMac, because everything was on there and on hard drive, and I had these saxophone samples that I had made, mostly from, Danny, uh, from a friend of mine and some, well, let's just say... Let's just say there was some other saxophones in there, okay? <laughs> and I just took whole notes, and I created this saxophone instrument. Yeah. And I was, I was like, well, hey, uh, and I think, did he call me? Yeah, he called me to just come and play some stuff, I guess, on the Pino record. And we were just trying different things. And I had written, this, I had this thing, and I had it in MIDI as well. And they both, they said, we got to do something with this. Mm. So we're working on it, and at a certain point, 
Blank, who at that point I had known enough to, even though he's, even though I remember when I came to Malibu High School to give a master class, you know, and he was a little chump in in the in the in the band. Uh, obviously a prodigy and very talented. Um, even though there's this generational thing and whatever, I I was already at that point just sort of like, this yeah. guy's got something. He's not just a guitar player. Um, and I had heard some of his productions and I knew how, you know, how uh, successful he had become, uh, deservingly so. And anyway, so at one point he goes, we're going to take a break. And he goes, hey, Larry, um, while we're on break, do you mind if I just kind of look at your MIDI a little bit, of the, the MIDI session for this, and maybe mess with it a little bit? And I'll tell you, rarely would I, <laughs> would I just go, yeah. I mean, it's like when I do sessions for people mobily, and I'm using a sampled instrument, and I say, I got a good take for you. And they go, great, can you send the MIDI too? I'm mm -hmm. usually like, well, what are you going to do with my MIDI? I mm -hmm. think I've got it in a pretty good place. And if I just sent you audio, you wouldn't really have that opportunity to fuck yeah. with my notes. So, but in the case of this, it just seemed like, oh, this is part of Blake's process. And I trust him, you know? So he's like, so we left the room and for maybe a half an hour, he reshaped the piece to a certain extent. Wow. Not only structurally, but musically a little bit. You know, and what he did, as far as I can remember, is there was a point where my piece became maybe a little bit or some idea was sequential, you know, a sequential um, follow up to some previous ideas that perhaps he thought was too predictable and too kind of square, square, yeah, in terms of how it rolled out. And so he kind of like, molded it into something that was better mm. really was. And the other thing with Blake is like, you gotta, you gotta wait till he starts throwing stuff at the, at the canvas, which is as far as my experience with him is one way he goes about making records and he does it very quickly. He doesn't do it in a way where he's throwing things f for months. And then, you know, he can just, he can, he can have me do a full overdub on, some weird thing and i'll think well he's not going to get anything out of that and then i'll hear it and i'll go oh my god mm -hmm. what did you do that celeste thing that i oh i put i bought the reverse reverb on it just to you know or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. he's he's using the computer as complete canvas mm -hmm. and together with his partner who engineers a lot of the stuff who's great and quick and can carry out all the little things that he, I mean, Blake can do it too, but, um, and then Pino is there as the, as the raw inspiration, you know, for how to build something around Pino. Um, and I wasn't there for any of the stuff with Ben Wendell. I was just, I was overdubbing on, on the thing that just came out. Not ben, ben Wendell. Wendell. Sam, ben Wendell. Sam. Sam Gendel. Yeah. Ben Wendell and Sam Gendel. <laughs> um, so I was there just with Pino and Blake. And uh, how was the music? Uh, um, uh, how did they approach you with the music? Uh, there was no sheet music, right? So. No, I, I, I had to jot down some things like I that Mellotron thing that yeah. happens. And actually wasn't my, that those were, those were actually Mellotron saxophones. So it's more my horns on that particular piece. I think those were things I kind of had to learn as, as we went, you know, the voice, you know, and then, um, and the thing is you don't necessarily walk away from uh, one of the sessions really knowing how things that you played are going to be utilized, you know, mm -hmm. And um, how does that affect your playing? Does it affect it? No. I mean, in that, in that case, I just try to carry out his directions, you know, mm -hmm. what, what, what he's thinking, because he's thinking two steps ahead, you know. Can you maybe, uh, um, yeah, how, 
What are your remembrances of his directions? Um, on that specific project? W whatever. Or, I'm just trying to get a sense of w what his yep. uh, directions would be like. Let's see what I can think. Um, what other things have we worked on? Um, I mean, the guy is just so into sound, right? So some of it will just be spent trying different instruments, I, I suppose, because he's in that studio. He's got everything. Mm. Um, and um, I'm trying to think about some of the other sessions. Um, There's a beautiful ballad on there where he says it, it came from something like a voice memo idea from you that the guys, oh. yeah. That might have been the saxophone thing because I don't it, that, it has some saxophone, but it's um, it's out of time. It's a ballad. It's like free flowing. Starts yeah. in C major, ends up in E flat major. Huh. Yeah, I still can't remember how that all ended up. Yeah. And I think that's the title track of the, I think that's the name of the yeah. record. Notes and with attachments. Yeah, notes, notes with attachments. Yeah. Um, and originally, I think uh, Pino said that there's some uh, passage in it that reminded me, reminded him of a hymn from his childhood or something like that. Something that he knew. It reminded when me of Weather Report, like a like uh, a Zavinul uh, type, you know, hauntingly beautiful ballad. Yeah, like the orphan. Do you know the orphan? Oh yeah, yeah. That would be good analysis. That's some Strauss right mm -hmm. there. Of course, he was Austrian. So there you go. He also liked that composer. What's the, what's the gold? Um... Goldings. <laughs> I'm sure he would have liked you. I'm talking yeah. about. Um, I'm talking about a guy who also came from Austria to the U.S. to score movies. Oh, um, he did. Um, Peter yeah. Erskine likes him too, uh, and John Nelson likes him. Um, gold, gold. Oh, let me look it up because it's so beautiful. Yeah, he was great. I have great uh, Itzhak Perlman uh, recordings of of violin concerto. Uh, gold. That's. I think I also transcribed something here. Um. Yeah, I wanted to show you this. Where is it? Um, yeah, some intermission music is good. Go. We we have it. We have it almost. Corn gold. Corn gold. That's it. Yeah. Let me show you the one thing. It's a piece. Yeah piece ends in G major and he goes it's almost like a diminished almost but half -hole. different weird yeah nice and it's it's doubled with uh, with uh, you know with the uh, vibraphone so like the you know mm. Sounds beautiful. Yeah, film man. Some of the film guys are amazing. I love John Williams. I think John oh, Williams. Oh man, is yeah. I heard yeah. a piece. I had speaking of harp. You told had, me. You told me. I, I listened to it afterwards. Oh, yeah. oh really? The harp so concerto. I haven't even li listened to it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Wow. He was showing it to me at the time. Yeah, that was at. Um, you are in contact with John Williams. And John Williams, I uh, yeah, because. I played under him with James Taylor at least twice at Tanglewood when we were doing James Taylor music, basically. And then he was working on the harp concerto, his harp concerto. And while we were at Tanglewood and I found myself in a room with him and James. Wow. And he was showing me the score. And he was telling me, uh, you know, the harp is, you really have to write you know, you gotta, yeah, you have to, you have to know the harp first, you know, because, you know, all the pet, you know, he's just showing me how 
it was just interesting things to take advantages to take advantage of because of the limitations limitations or mm -hmm. the interesting pedal things that yeah. you know you do it was wild and i have beautiful black and white pictures that somebody was taking when wow. we were we were in that little uh rehearsal room he i mean you know he really knew some music wow. and he knew emotion you know so that's why he, he gets me every time gets me every time what he does emotionally really if you compare him to i'm not going to name any names it's just that yeah the people when people try to take his place in a in a thing where it's necessary to there's so much action and there's so much need for music and he can say so much he can tell us so much during a scene where there's no dialogue yeah and it's just like wow very specific emotional things you know not just some generic fucking shit Your doorbell? That was uh, also from ET. Really? Yeah, that's the ET code. You're kidding. That's the code. That's the code. I mean, that again? I'm playing it soft because of my neighbors. Oh. He plays it up here actually. Ah. Is it 12 tones? Not quite. Uh, no, it's 10 yeah. notes. Yeah, that's cool. No, it's different than this one. But that's hip as well. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And how they communicate. How they communicate. Man, the, the... I think I got into synthesizers because of watching that dude sure. in that scene. Sure, of course. Right? Yeah. Communicating with the fucking spaceship? Yeah. It's and incredible. It goes, ah, bah, yeah. And everything's just, oh, man. Yeah. And the colors and, oh, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And then a few years later, I, I could be seen at a uh, Lowry piano and organ store, you know, like where my, my mother would take me. She would drop me off at this. This is funny because this is before I knew anything about Hammond organ tradition or anything. Yeah. I just loved to sit at organs because they felt like big spaceships sure and there was this you know that was where the days where you could go to a huge fucking organ mall just a huge fucking uh room of of uh those kinds of organs with three manuals four manuals she would drop me off and go shopping and we'd pretend that i was interested in getting one of these <laughs> organs and i'd just be sitting there for hours you know as a uh, young man can we help you no no i'm fine and uh, we eventually had organs. We had, did have a, a couple different organs in our home. Not big. Well, one was huge. My father found it for free, and somebody delivered it. It was a Goldbranson fucking mm. jazz organ. And then before that, we had this little Yamaha organ with the Foxtrot. And the, you know. And now I have uh, this. Uh, can you see? Probably mm -hmm. not. It's a Lowry Genie. That's mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Um, but it was the control, you know, it was the orchestral one man band aspect of, of the organ. That's yeah. like, I don't need anybody, you know, uh, and, and the, yeah. And the, and the, and the sense that you were, or you could orchestrate, yeah. you know, and I was really into synthesizers as a kid, as, as a, you know, for the same reason. Yeah. Um, huh. Yeah, and also the 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 passion for the bass movement movement stuff yeah. is, uh, you know, that's part of the deal. Yeah, and that coincided with loving Dave McKenna as oh, right. one of the first pianists that I knew. Yeah, who play the shit out of the bass lines, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, that's what you do when you play solo. You play bass lines. Yeah. Um, but I think something about that bass function. You know, it was always really attracted to, attractive to me. I remember kind of maybe feeling the bass. We, I went to a, grew up going to a going to a Jewish temple. Went to Hebrew school. 
in more religious temples, they don't have musical instruments. Like it's, a, you know, it's not, but in the reformed sect, which is sort of the least pious, mm. you know, I guess the least strict, you know, our, our, uh, temple was so reformed. It was closed on the Jewish holidays. <laughs> um, no, but, uh, that's a Woody Allen joke. I can't talk about Woody Allen anymore, unfortunately. Mm. Okay. So, uh, I remember feeling that then they had an organ, they had a little electric organ. I remember kind of feeling it. And, and, and he has that, that one of those real, um, warm sounds that some of those organs would have. And I remember liking that. Mm. Um, but anyway, how about the bass in general? Um, when you became more and more uh, an organ player and um, did you also check out s specific bassists for their I mean I always tuned into the bass the Paul Chambers I always tuned into Ray Brown mm. with our Peterson Trio yeah Israel Crosby mm -hmm. with Ahmad Jocko oh yeah for sure but also as a composer and you know all that um, but yes, bass players, Charlie Hayden, um, all of Miles' bass players, yeah. um, electric bass players like Jocko, like, uh, the legendary Paul, Paul Jackson. That's, oh, well, Paul Jackson, although I probably didn't know it was Paul Jackson at that time, but yes, mm. uh, the bass player with Aretha, you know with Purdy and all that classic stuff. I'm thinking of, uh, Chuck Rainey. Chuck, Chuck Rainey. Rainey. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous. Mm. Um, stuff like that. I was very much into, um, I also really liked that, that Bill Evans record where he played Rhodes. And he from walked left to from, Ryan. One of those, yeah, where he walked bass on a couple tunes on the roads. I thought, whoa, that feels good with the piano soloing on one channel mm. and the road comping on the other. I just remember thinking, that sounds full. That yeah. sounds real good. Yeah. But Zalonel too, because, oh, yeah. you, you know, because when Zalonel and Wayne would do their own thing or what Zalonel would do intros where he's sort of his own oh, bass yeah. player, to me, he was an orchestra. Oh, I yeah. always suspected maybe he played organ, you mm. know, because um, he knew how to manipulate samples. I mean, not sample sounds, <laughs> analog <laughs> sound, like, yeah, like no you other know. guy, yeah. And then he used a, a volume pedal. Do you ever see like the? If you can find pictures of like what was at his feet mm -hmm. on a live on a live record. It's just mm. tons of pedals. Yeah. That he's just had control over, like, I'm going to bring this in. Oh, I, yeah. And he can work that out. Not to mention using tape, using s his own samples, you know, mm -hmm. and um, triggering tape to give him whatever. Um, Did you uh, ever meet him? Yes. I met him it, twice, maybe three times. The first time I met him, I was on an escalator. Um, at the um, IAJE, the International yeah. Association of Jazz Educators. I guess I was on Warner Brothers at the time. Yeah, I was definitely on Warner Brothers at the time. And Matt Pearson was there, and he was he was the A and R guy who um, signed me to Warner. And he was with Joe, and we end up on an escalator, and they're talking, and it's totally awkward because I'm like I'm. You know, it's Joe Zalinal. And then Matt goes, oh, Joe, you know Larry Goldings. And, uh, and he goes, and this is wild because this talk about how times have changed. There was a jazz label, you know, uh, uh, there was a jazz department, strong one. And one of the things they would do is, uh, you know, like different airlines, an airline might make yeah. a deal with, uh, you know, and you'd be on the airlines play jazz playlist for a couple months. He literally said, "Oh yeah, I heard I heard a song of yours on the flight on the flight over on the on the you know." And he goes, "Very melodic." Wow. I was like, "Holy shit!" Wow. 
but he said it in that tough kind mm-hmm. of very melodic with, with the wrong accent. I'm using more of a you know uh, Eastern European. Yeah. Um, very melodic. <laughs> <laughs> I like Joe well, Savinovsky. And um, no, I was like, I was just flying the rest of that day. I was just mm-hmm. like Joe's album. Wow. And then I saw him when he had already been, I think, diagnosed with something. Mm. And he was much just just weaker as a as a man, as a person. It was really wild. And he also seemed Yeah, he didn't have that tough exterior. That was at the Hollywood Bowl. Mm. And that was the last time I saw him. I just saw that his son died. Wow. That's Cope. Oh, Eric. No. Yeah. He was only 59 or something like that. Oh, shit. Um, but, you know, Masters, oh, look, Chick. Yeah. I to think about Chick. What's your, what, 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 what's, if you could encapsulize, what would be the Chick that really is on your desert, your Chick Korea desert island? Um, the complete is sessions. Huh? Looking at my chick pile, I have a pile of chick records here that are, because I was mm. listening the whole time. Mm. You know, uh, the complete is sessions. Okay, that's with Dave Holland, Benny Maupin, Jack DeJohnet, Woody Shaw, and Hubert Laws, and right. another drummer called um, Horace Alt Arnold. Yeah, and that's some some uh, yeah, that's my favorite chick, but also a chick with with Miles and especially that that period, you know incredible but i really like that up until he died uh he was very very active still and always putting together new bands and stuff like that yeah. and other artists of that caliber uh they seem to not to do I that rest at rest on their laurels a little yeah bit. yeah well he was always yeah i saw him in spain he had that band with abishai cohen hmm. on bass and jeff ballard and mm-hmm. it was all it was Monk and the New Tunes, and mm-hmm. that was an amazing concert. Just yeah. I remember rhythmically, just being blown away by Chick's ideas. Yeah, how he play with the band and just the humor and the playfulness. Mm-hmm. And the other thing about Chick that I loved is that he wasn't dripping ever with with sentimentality when he played ballads and mm-hmm. things like that. You yeah, know, it was wasn't playful. Yeah, it was it, it was beautiful maybe, but it wasn't sentimental. Yeah, you know. Like, did you ever hear a, a later record he made on Concord of solo piano and he played Lush Life? No. He did just the most beautiful, the brilliant chick thing to it mm-hmm. where he found a, an ostinato bass yeah. to, to use throughout the entire thing. Not, mm. not, not something that didn't move, but it moved throughout the piece. And I don't remember what it is, but I couldn't find it actually on iTunes. Uh, and I remember realizing, like, like, yeah, I mean, only Shikaria could approach something that's so lush, mm. you know, like Lush Life with all those harmonic possibilities. And he's, of course, he's using the harmonic, he's playing the tune, but he weaves it with this chic like, not like something a chick would do. <laughs> um, this chic like, um, uh, ostinato idea that was just it was like brilliant yeah brilliant and he's not playing it in this kind of oh pull your heartstrings way he didn't play like that but he didn't play coldly either yeah you know you know so when he, he when he died uh, the first thing that I had to listen to is um, you know I was like oh shit he chick died <laughs> Uh, I couldn't really believe it because it was so agile and so active always. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking, okay, sh- now he sings, now he's off. What should I go to first? Yeah. The thing is, what I went to first is something that, um, as I told you before, you know, there's. I grew up listening to to him and also this solo uh, ECM records that he did. You know, uh, that's just what what my father loved. So. Mm. And there's videos of me as a, a little boy playing along with uh, Now He Sings, Now He Sobs with drumsticks and stuff like that. But as I told you, when I was a teenager, I had to find my own stuff. So I was trying to learn Autumn Leaves and mm. illegally downloading 
MP3s from the side <laughs> of all the versions of uh, Autumn Leaves that I could get. And mm -hmm. uh, one of them was Chick playing with Bobby McFerrin in duo. Mm. Have you heard this recording? I'm not sure if I have. It's, it's pretty sure. funny, actually. It's very funny. Bobby McFerrin is, is, is almost like a stand-up comedian in, in that in that song so he's making all all fun the, the whole the whole time but what chick plays and i can still tap into that feeling is like how on earth could you think of stuff like that to play behind a melody like that you know it's like always like almost like like magic like who would think of stuff like that his mind was very free yeah very free very supple and so quick yeah quick uh, I got into Chick through, well, <laughs> I had that, you know, that was in the real book. Mm. It was one of the first things I looked at the real book, just like, oh, I think I can read this. <laughs> and then found the record. And I love the Gary Burton duo stuff. Yeah. I thought just brilliant. Um, technically, it just seems so impossible and musically so beautiful. And mm -hmm. the two were just like, did they grow up together? What's going on here? You know, there's just like, uh, but also, but I didn't know the history of Chick, you know, coming up. So I knew like Friends with yep. Steve Gadd with yep. the Smurf on the cover. Yes. And uh, I knew like some of those, like the Leprechaun or My Spanish Heart, you know, the fusion e things. Yeah. Um, and then like Mike, the one with Michael Brecker, Three Quartets. Oh, yeah. I like that. Didn't really understand it, but I just liked it. Pretty out there, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, the duo with duos with Herbie, I remember. Oh yeah. Didn't know anything about his playing with Chick? Didn't know. I mean, with Miles, didn't know about anything like him as a sideman. Only later did I hear him with uh, Stan Getz. Oh yeah. And I didn't know how he sing. Uh, now he sings. Now he sobs. I still don't really know that record back and backwards and forwards. I know Matrix. Yeah. I don't think we transcribed anything from that record. Um, kind of, for whatever reason, in terms of the things that I really spent time with, I was more Keith and Herbie. Yeah. And even McCoy more than Chick. Mm. But I have to say, Keith as a, I mean, um, Chick as a composer, I have to say, I always thought was heavy. And completely um, recognizable. Yeah. You know, and the way the Spanish flavor and his understanding of diminished somehow, just mm -hmm. like in his writing and stuff. Um, uh, and I just always saw him as a complete musician, you know. Yeah. Then he's playing classical music, you know. And when I started traveling and maybe running into him or knowing or seeing him at least in the same room he just seems so approachable yeah you no know, he seemed different from other mm -hmm. not that i mean i think jazz musicians generally are approachable but for someone that heavy i mean it's just like it seemed like and he was yeah you know by the you know by the last time i saw him i think he knew who i was and uh sat down with me for five minutes you know and I was, you know, he was just super cool. Yeah. Humble. And like he said in that quote that's being reprinted, you know, you know, more than anything, music is fun. You know, that's the reason why you should get into it. You yeah. know, if you, if you have the passion, you know, it's fun on top of everything else. And really he had loads of fun. You could oh, tell. Yeah. Um, but we didn't get into what, what is your favorite record of his? Um, doesn't have to be one of his it could also be something else right um, I do love him with Miles he's on some of the tracks on uh, Fee, Fee de Kilimanjaro oh, isn't yeah. he I love him on that mm -hmm. um, I love him uh, anything with Miles yeah. uh I, I I do love him with Roy Haynes. The later stuff he did with Roy Haynes, I think, is great. The yeah. Monk stuff. Yeah. Um, but Powell? Is probably, yeah. 
there's probably stuff like I don't know if I know the stuff you're talking about very well. The yes sessions. Yeah. yeah, I'll send it to you. And I I remember listening to Light as a Feather, a lot. Yeah. You know, loved his Rhodes playing. Was it Rhodes or Wurlitzer? It was Rhodes. Rhodes, I think. Um, I remember he took this amazing synth solo on a Jeff Lorber record. <laughs> that mm -hmm. I really Soft space. Um, yeah, loads of stuff. That one that I was talking about where he plays Lush Life, it's yeah. definitely worth hearing. Um, but as you can tell, like I could name many more Keith records that I know really well for some reason yeah. than Chick. But, um, maybe because at the time I thought, well, Chick is a little colder. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And maybe that, whatever. Um, but McCoy's not all that, you know, McCoy has a, some of that too, sort of, you know, the, the, this, um, but I don't know. There's something about the way Chick articulates, even at fast tempos, just always mm -hmm. killed me. You yeah. know, the notes are, you know, the sound is not diminished. You know, yeah, it's That's true. What he has to play, his articulation is strong. The piano sound is big. The notes seem, even at fast tempo, seem a little bit longer than mm -hmm. maybe a McCoy played mm -hmm. fast. Not that he had a bad sound, McCoy, and it's insane, but. Uh, it's just amazing. Um, in those five min minutes with uh, Chick, did you talk to him about any of that? No, it was probably just about, he was literally coming off his tour bus right. as me and Peter and, and Bill were leaving the hotel. They were checking in. Mm. And this was a band, he had L Lionel Luiki, Luiki. Yeah. Um Steve Gatt? And Steve, I guess, must have been there. Mm. Yeah. And they were tired, but I said, hey, chick, you know, and he greeted me really warmly. And there was like a little bench right there. And, he, you know, he just sat down, you know, we mm. just, he just started, you know, where are you coming from? Just kind of small talk. But then it was like, he was just, you know, telling me about the, it just seemed like so many things were going on, you yeah. know, just like he had this tour, tell me about a, piano concert he did with so-and-so and, -so, and you know, it's like the guy was just a force yeah and never i mean not an, an an ounce of of any kind of like he needed to prove something <laughs> to, to anybody he didn't he he was perfectly comfortable with himself mm -hmm. and um happy to share whatever it was like he the whole pandemic he was teaching online yeah did you he was did one you of the did you see the the um, when he would just practice at home for? Yeah, it was great. I mean, that was what I was hoping for. I mean, dreaming about with with I mean with you also. You know, it's so great that we get to be a fly on the wall now with all the greats in a way, and everybody's yeah. ready to share. And I, I remember sitting in my little room at my parents' house as a teenager. I was like, how would it look if Chick is? practicing something at home or you know and now yeah. we just get to see it yeah pretty cool it was great he was a very giving artist and person um how is it for yeah. you now to to share with people and to uh to engage you seem to enjoy it a lot yes i mean for me it's just a way of <laughs> connecting with people at a time when we can't connect, yeah. you know, and even though I still get dark about it, um, after doing it pretty regularly since this lockdown started, it is very, uh, apparent that people appreciate it, you know, mm. and I, I'd like that. I like that people from all over the world are saying, and you know, we're, stuck here at least especially i remember during when when in italy it was so mm. horrible yeah i remember doing some there and getting some messages from people saying you know you don't know how this great this is that we can watch this you know we can't can't go anywhere and um 
Yeah, but I'm what I'm what I'm uh, yeah. curious about is your um, you're very honest about everything that's happening while you're doing it, and even if you mess up something or uh, if you I don't know um, you acknowledge something when you I've seen you talk about moments where you're like oh I've hit a wall here uh, this is not how the song is going you're very honest you're very um, just because i yeah and there is maybe something about the fact that there isn't a physical audience um and you're not getting any feedback <laughs> um that makes you forget that they're there mm -hmm. you know and when i do that on, on twitch um that seems to be a platform for like that that's meant for that It's mm. it's see be people who are into just like let's just see what what he's doing you know mm. and um and that's educational like you said watching chick to practice you know like oh what's he struggling with yeah. you know uh, it's fascinating and also uh, perhaps uh, it almost feels like some of that not not caring. You know, healthy not caring might transfer over to when we're back playing live mm -hmm. you know, from this experience, mixed with the feeling that we're just so <laughs> joyful to be able to do it again. Yeah. You know, and also I think we've all been thinking about what does this all mean? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> we chose this life and now this life is not possible. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Not to the extent uh, to where we could make a living from it. Mm -hmm. It's not. I mean, this this is not working. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad I have this. Yeah, and I'm making something from Patreon, and people are asking me to do some overdubs, and but this is not sustainable. So, you know, I was on the road half the year, you know, sometimes more. That is still, and I'm not going to say unfortunately, because, man, the things that you don't have, when you don't have them anymore, you really appreciate them. I mean, my God. I mean, yeah. how much complaining do we do about the road, you yeah. know, about sleeplessness, about, you know, ridiculous, stupid geographic plans? It used to, to take up all my Facebook feed from U.S. musicians, actually. Complain, <laughs> complaining about the road and then it was like all trump and now it's all covid <laughs> and dying musicians oh god yeah and you know what uh like jim hall used to say on the road are we frozen no okay you froze for a like jim hall used to say like on like the worst travel day like you know he goes you know guys We are privileged. You have to remember, this is still a privilege to do this. Look where yeah. we are, you know, and we might be some incredible place. And if Jim Hall, after all the years he had done traveling, can yeah. say that, can have that attitude, then you better fucking shut up, little punk yeah. piano player. Yeah. You know, unless it's not for you, you know. And I went through a lot of, of years thinking this isn't for me anymore just can't be in the in a bus anymore i yeah. can't live like this you know and look that's that's a that's a that's a, a reality it is it can be very unhealthy <laughs> but also is it is there another side for you as well uh because i i started noticing like uh at first i was like uh okay if, if somebody is taking away the thing that you identify so much as who are you You know, and mm -hmm. I think we all went through this, through this, and then you discover maybe other things that you like to do, and other things that you appreciate and and took well, for granted before. There's other things within music that, mm. through these live streams and through me just being forced to just, well, I'm gonna fuck around, do the things that I, transferring the things that I normally just do when nobody's watching. For instance. A perfect example, playing along with the Beatles. Yeah. Okay. 
like playing along with a record, something I used to do as a kid. Yeah. That was, I think a lot of musicians did that, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. But now I can get the stems of Beatles songs. I can, so I put, I don't know if you saw that, but I, I put up just McCartney's bass line on something, on the song something, and Ringo. And I was just like, well, what if this was a piano feature, yeah. you know, and I, and I'm playing with the, with the rear room. These are just things that I would, would have done as a kid if I, if I had the means to do that, just because it's fun and it's kind of kooky. I'm doing these kinds of things now in front of people, thinking, still thinking this is kooky. Yeah. But I'm realizing that, that maybe I've taken for granted some of the aspects of my talent mm -hmm. <laughs> that I don't show, that I don't normally show people, mm. you know, um, that I love to play guitar sounds. Yeah. I just downloaded yesterday. I just bought a $79 really good sounding lap steel mm. where you can tell, you can tell the instrument to only bend the bottom note or the middle note or the top mm. note of the chord. Wow. Fuck cool as shit. Mm. And I'm like, and I've always loved guitar. I've always loved I've written songs on a guitar sample because I'm, it just gets me to hear different things. You write differently because if you want the sample to sound realistic, you have to play more or less within the limitations yeah. of the guitar. Similarly, it is true, and I'm sure you've experienced this, that you'll sit down on an instrument, a piano, but it's not your piano. It's some upright piano. Or like, you know, I'm thinking of a specific thing with me. My friend Jay Bellarose had this really shitty spin it and we were hanging out late at night and uh, i wrote this tune this one On that piano, and I definitely wouldn't have had that song if Is it weren't it for that. On in my room, or no, it's on um, Salad Day. I mean, it's on, it's called Salad Days, and it's from when Larry met Harry. Oh yeah, Brand I have that one. Day. I have that one. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I could have re-recorded it on in my room. I don't remember, but. You know, you sit down at a particular instrument and sometimes it just tells you what to do, Yeah. you know, or, or you just innately find what's the strong, spot. the sweet spots. Yeah. And that brings you to a direction that I know wouldn't have come out of a different instrument. Yeah. I love that. And that's what I love about sample sounds. Yeah. Same reason why I'm hunting for inspiring samples, because you will get into a composition a different way, you know that way especially when you're trying to play in the in the within the limitations and strengths of the of the sound mm. you know so that's the main reason why i love uh because i get bored i get bored with my instrument also i don't have a particularly inspiring i do like that piano but it's an upright piano and there's only so so much i can really pull off on it mm. and um so sometimes um, I'll get something out of a, another piano sample or, a, you know, um, but, uh, I will remember when I look close, more closely at my iTunes library or whatever, um, some things that I wrote, you know, with a guitar sample. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Hmm. But, uh, anyway, how you feeling? I'm feeling good. I, I, and I'm feeling grateful that you approached me to do this again. Oh, well, you're, you're the perfect person for anything having to do with the type of material we're, 
we're talking about. And I'm, you know, I'm, we've gone a, a while. I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I've, I've figured out, well, what I didn't know or I didn't put together was all the music, not only classical, but, you know, because of how you grew up. I mean, that is just so unique. Mm. That is so unique. And uh, I was wondering, just from you, did did you early on take very strict piano lessons from either your parents or somebody else in terms of technique and sound and stuff like that? Um, my father arranged for a piano lesson uh, with a colleague of his when he noticed that I would go to the piano and you know just fumble around a little bit because mm -hmm. I was playing drums before that. And mm -hmm. when I was ten, I then switched to piano because of this first lesson. And it was uh, very much uh, from learning from the ear. Although my teacher was giving me classical pieces, he, he would notice that I would kind of try to see how he was playing them and then trying to go from ear to, to just play what he played. So I, I hmm. know a lot of first pages of classical pieces, <laughs> you know, from playing myself. But That's then the we, we went to, into, uh, you know, uh, improvised material and the real book and he was showing me voicing and stuff like that. Uh, and the real um, revelations for me in terms of sound and technique mm -hmm. actually came when I, uh, when I began studying with uh, uh, Hubert Nuss, who is a great piano player from Germany, mm. who was my most important teacher, still a, a great friend and incredible piano player. And he kind of instilled in me... Uh, um, approaching the piano and playing with a sense of relaxation with with everything that you play is coming out of a relaxation using natural body weight arm weight yeah. and no movement with the fingers as as yeah. the the optimum the um, the goal not to use yeah. your fingers and just right. play as if the note is coming from here um, this is that what blew my mind and what what really helped me because I had tendonitis. Say again. I'm sorry. I wish I could go back in time and study that way. You know, with somebody. Mm. You but know. you look you look the same. I mean, I think you you look like you're not moving at all, and uh, and you have a huge sound. So I don't know what you what you mean. I'm pretty tense, actually. In, I'm, I can I can get very tense, and also um, the faster the passage or the faster the tempo, um, I, I I can't relax, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't really feel like I have. Like I was saying about Chick, mm -hmm. articulation and his sound is always strong, no matter what tempo. Mm -hmm. I feel like for me that's a thing that is not definitely not true. I mean that 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 shows some uh that i it, it kind of it kind of shows to me that i don't i don't have that part of it together so much but is it the same uh, same thing when you experience it in the moment or is it different than when you listen back and realize or oh, maybe it's not as as bad no, as i thought I can, I can sound more relaxed than i felt when i played it but what it what it translates to is sort of uh like like inefficient playing sometimes like i will i will have i will be tired i will be um something might hurt mm. you know after something and i don't you know i haven't been doing a lot of gigs lately that <laughs> that require a lot of technique you know mm. um but um, it's funny. I look at old recordings of myself, like video things that I can where I can watch myself, and I seem like I had better command <laughs> then. Like I'm doing tactical things, looking pretty good, and I'm like, I don't think I could play that as 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 well now. Um, I have the same thing. I have Do the you? same thing, but I noticed other things in my playing sure. that I wasn't able to. I mean, of course, understanding of the music is is growing, and and uh, yeah, is, yeah. Uh, but but still, some things that I have been playing that I played fifteen years ago, I, when I now listen to them, like I, 
I don't know how to play this. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think that maybe that it's a natural thing. Like looking at old photos of yourself, you, you're like, mm. I could not wear these jeans now, you know, or. I couldn't have been that ugly. Yeah, I mean, right. look at me now. <laughs> um, no, that, that's true. Um, but no, I was watching this masterclass with Chris John Zimmerman the other yeah. day. I was talking, telling you about that. Yeah. And he was talking about that too. He was just like, even with someone who obviously he's not like just like a finger player, the person can play. He's like, just, just remember, but he's seeing that there are times that this person, like at one point he said, you're not getting to the bottom. I can't, I'm not hearing that the note, this is yeah. a sample, that the note is, is hitting the bottom. Yeah. You know? So he had this one kid do this, get on the floor. Did your teacher ever have to do this? And he was like, he was like doing that, something like that from the ground. Wow. Because he felt like if you're from down there, you're definitely going to be hitting the bottom of the key. You know, something like that. Um, so now, the, you know, all my gigs, I, I don't ask for a bank. Uh, <laughs> um, Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my teacher once put weights on my arms. Oh, that can't be good. Now, just to just to um, to to create the illusion or to create the awareness for how heavy your arm could feel, because mm. in a way you're always you're always you're always holding it up somehow. Because we learned how to uh, manipulate our limbs to just do whatever. Yeah. But if you yeah. if you carry a baby that's awake it's and uh or yeah if it's awake it's lighter but if it's asleep everything is the baby is super heavy you know and it's the same thing with your arms if you carry them the whole time they're super light but if you yeah. actually sometimes fall asleep on your arm and your arm is asleep you realize yeah. how heavy it is and with that yeah. kind of relaxation playing with that relaxation um everything becomes more easy Somehow. Yeah. Who's that teacher who Barry Harris studied with and a lot and a lot of um Sophia Rosoff? Yeah. There's a video. Did you see you should see Barry's? Did you see the movie about Barry? It's very oh, good. I love it. Yeah. Isn't that great with the yes. kids? Yes. It's touching. Yeah. yeah. I remember that scene with Sophia Rosoff when she's sort of they're doing like yeah, they're yeah, doing yeah. some kind of, um and she's just going yeah. you know. Yeah. Um Kenny Werner, I mean, the one le private lesson I took with Kenny was just about trying to get, just trying to just play five notes correctly, you know, hmm. with full full relaxation. Wow. Pretty hard to do once if you're not, if you haven't been doing it. Mm. Um, also, Claudio Rao. Oh, yeah. Editing the rotation. So I saw some exercise where he's like. Mm. Because it right because that's just that's weight right there. Yeah, right? totally. Just throwing your weight. But how do you get the little micro moves mm. and play well? I guess that's I mean with that rotation technique, you know. Mm. How, do, how do you rotate within, you know, a that's third, true. and 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 actually use the weight? I, I mean, it's the kind of things like playing accordion. I'll I'll never figure it out because I didn't start when I was four. I just, I just feel like I'm not going to get it. You'll be oh. fine, Larry. You'll be fine. Oh, it's never going to happen for me. <laughs> but, you know, there's just certain people, man. You hear them play a chord and you're like, yeah, I can't get that sound, you know. But also, I will admit that when asked what kind of, you know, you have your choice of piano, you know, I will actually say that I don't want a concert grant necessarily. Yeah. You no, know, because I'm not sure how difficult that piano is going to be for me to play. Mm. I'm afraid to say that. It's Still okay. a man. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, those are long strings, man. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and I sound, I sound, you know, sometimes I'll sound, I'll sound better on a smaller piano. That's just the way it goes. Mm. Cause I'm just feel like I can get what seems to be a, you know, relative to that piano, a big sound, but I've, you know, I've been in situations with, with really big pianos where I just go, well, I'm just going to totally change the way I play tonight because I can't, you know, I can't get around it, mm. particularly fast passages, or at least if I do, they, they're barely audible. <laughs> they're just, mm. I'm not getting the sound uh, from playing fat when I'm playing fast. I'll play slower. I'll play more chordal. And instruments always have an effect on how, maybe it's not conscious, but how I might change up my playing. Totally, yeah. Does that happen with you? Yes, totally. But I feel like that's, for me, that's... That's a good thing. A good thing. Yeah. Otherwise, you're struggling. Yeah. You know, if you have the instinct to know, like, what to maybe avoid on this instrument... Uh, you know, as uh, so as to sound and be as supportive as possible if you're playing with others. Yeah. Um, I do that. I definitely do that. Um, and of course, we have, as, as keyboard players, we have a certain amount of practice of having to do that. With yeah, because there's something different every night. Different or just bad. <laughs> yeah. You know, substandard instruments. Yeah. You know. Different shades um, of bad Different shades of bad. As Carla Blay used to say about the road, she said, um, expect anything, accept anything. No, shit. It's expect the worst, right? Oh, yeah, you know the expression. All right. Let's do it again as if I'm the one who's telling the story, okay? Sure. Yeah, 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 sure. Sure thing. You know, as Carla Blay used to say. What did she say, Larry? Great story. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Carla used to say, expect the worst, accept the worst, demand the worst. Mm. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. I might have to get some lunch. Man, uh, totally cool. I mean, I, thank you for doing this with me. Thank you. Thank you for um, wanting to do it with me and... Thank you.